These are just some recap notes on what I like to call the existence theorems. Uh, we'll have the intermediate value theorem, the extreme value theorem, and the mean value theorem. So I found this um, display online. There's a few small details with it, but not enough worth me retyping the whole thing. So just kind of watch as we go. We'll fill it in together and it should be easy 100% points because we're going to do the whole thing together. So the first thing we're going to do is discuss the intermediate value theorem, which you are allowed to abbreviate as the IVT. So all the theorems have an, a hypothesis that must be met. And by that I mean a hypothesis is the if part of an if-then statement. So it'd be, for example, if you have brown hair, then you will get a five on the AP exam. The if has to be met for you to draw the conclusion. So if, if, the minute I say, if you have brown hair, people with blonde hair immediately count themselves out for what I'm gonna say next. And when that happens with mathematics, we say that the hypothesis has to be met in order for you to even apply the theorem. So when you use these in FRQs, this is actually really important right here that when you're justifying a theorem, you have to always be, begin by stating that the hypothesis has been met or the condition have been fulfilled. So the conditions or the hypothesis of the intermediate value theorem says that whatever function is in question, it must be continuous. So continuity is the hypothesis for the IVT. And then it states that we've got um, there's at least one value C where it falls between the limits such that f of c equals k. Remember, f of is a y at or a y value. So what it's really saying is k can be any number between these two y values. And I think when we first did this in chapter one, I said think about temperature at certain times. Like a could be time one and b would be time two f of a would be the temperature at time one, let's say it was 30 degrees, and f of b would be the temperature at time two, let's say it dropped to negative 10. What it's saying is that k is any y value between those, and if I'm connecting them without lifting, lifting my pencil, which means in a continuous fashion, then I have to hit every temperature between 30 and negative 10. So again, this is a Y value theorem. It guarantees the existence of a Y value. You will never do this analytically. So that's one thing I don't like about this. You will have to do it tabularly though. So we'll put that on the back in just a moment. Graphically, this is what it's stating. So here's my function. I've got my F of one being negative one and my F of negative two, I think that's a negative two or is that a negative one? It doesn't really matter. I think it's a negative one is up there at three and I'm connecting them in a continuous manner. So what the IVT says is I can take my pen and put a blue dot anywhere on the Y axis between F of A and F of B. I'm gonna put it right here just cause. What this theorem guarantees is at least one place on the x-axis, so it's at least one x value such that f of c equals k. In this case, my k looks like it's about 1.7-ish. I'm guaranteed that I must pass through 1.7 or 2.9 or, or, or 1.3. Anything between the y values must get hit. So when we justify our work for the IVT, we say since f is, and we always need to state that the hypothesis is met, is continuous with f of negative one equaling three and f of one equaling negative one. Then any y value between negative one and three exists over the interval by the intermediate value theorem. So again, when you're doing this on the AP exam, it won't be x, f of x. Um, let's flip your paper all the way over on the back so I can show you how that gets. Go all the way to the back of your paper. I'm gonna go to a blank sheet right here. Usually these are tabular. So let's write IVT right here. Something is usually charted over time, so it's not usually x values. And let's maybe say we're charting um, time and velocity over time. 
in the stem of the problem, it'll say v of t is, and it'll either say continuous or to say differentiable, which implies continuity. So v of t is continuous. All right, let's go say we're going 0, 1, 3, 4, 7, 10. And then let's suppose this is 2, negative 1, um, negative 3, 4, 5, 6. What it will say is, maybe there's a part A of an FRQ, how many times was the particle at rest on the interval from 0 to 10. And then it'll say, justify. All right, so I go to the table and I realize that this is a table charting velocity. A particle is at rest when the velocity is, for an instant, 0. So what I look for on this table is, when must the velocity have been zero? It started at two, and it moved continuously to negative one, so it must have passed through zero on this interval at least once. And although I don't know exactly what's happening in this time interval, I am not guaranteed a zero. There could be, but I'm not, because it's negative and still negative. And then in this interval, I went from negative three up to 4. I must pass through 0 since the function's continuous. And although I might have in these two intervals, I'm not guaranteed. So we would say at least twice. All right? Now, that's not justifying. We would have to say, since we have to state that the hypothesis is met, v of t is continuous as given in the stem of the problem, but you don't need to write that. Since V is continuous with V of 0 equaling 2 and V of 1 equaling negative 1, right? The IVT guarantees at least, it's kind of a pain to write out, right? One T between zero and one. So it's hard to write it out. I mean, I can see it. I had to pass through zero at least once, but how do I say it? I'm saying V of zero equals two. Sometimes it's nice to even say that that's positive and that this is negative, but it's pretty clear. The IVT guarantees at least one T from zero and one such that v of t equals 0. And the reason is because 0 is between 2 and negative 1. That's probably overkill, but it's good. My other one is, similarly, they are a pain to write out, but they're easy. Similarly, v of 3 equals negative 3, which is less than 0, and v of 4 equals 4, which is greater than 0. So, the IVT guarantees a T on that interval from 3 to 4, such that V of T equals 0. Now, that's a long um, paragraph. I'm 100% sure, though, that that gives full credit. You could have probably consolidated them into one argument, but you do need to state continuity. You do need to put numerical analysis down here, and you do need to reference the IVT. You could have probably combined the two intervals in one argument. That's usually how you'll see it on the AP exam. So let's go back here and keep on rolling. So again, you won't do it analytically. So. Um, we're going to move on to the EVT. The EVT is the easiest one. Um, it's called the extreme value theorem, and it's a little bit silly, but 
again, the only thing required in the hypothesis is, is the conclusion, sorry, continuity. Continuity again. Continuity. Isn't this fun, guys? I'm having a blast. Continuity. Um, function must be continuity. Must be continuous. There. All right. What do, can we say if a function is continuous on a closed interval, technically? Really what this says is it has to have at least one absolute highest point and one absolute lowest point. The conclusion written in math says there has to be at least one C element of AB such that F of C is greater than or equal to F of X for all X, etc. Really our conclusion is just that we are guaranteed an absolute max and an absolute min, at least one. It's What it's saying is you can't draw a continuous function that does not have an absolute max or an absolute min. You might say, how about a horizontal line? All the points on a horizontal line are considered both absolute maxes and absolute mins because in the definition it always says greater than or equal to all or less than or equal to all. So it kind of covers the horizontal line issue. So remember when we do it analytically, we've done that quite a bit where we've made what we call a candidate table where we analyze at the endpoints. So we put those on because a function can have a max or a min and often does at the endpoint values. And then we also find the turning points or the critical values. Those are where our derivative is either equal to zero or undefined. Remember, that's kind of important because this function right here has an absolute max where the derivative does not exist. Continuity is all that is required. So when we make our candidate table, we do endpoint, endpoint, and critical values. The greatest of these is our max, tied at zero. The least of these is the min. And here's the graph of that as well. We've got these two tied for our max, and one negative one being our min, and that's where the derivative equals zero. You usually, I don't see these very often on FRQs. I don't know that I ever have seen the EVT on an FRQ. Um, they're usually multiple choice. And it'll say something like, oh, I don't know, g of x has no absolute min on the interval from 2 to 5. What can we conclude about g? And if it didn't have an absolute max or an absolute min, it means we can conclude that there had to have been a discontinuity, maybe an asymptote, right? So that we couldn't grab a hold of the absolute max or min, or maybe even a hole in the graph because I can't grab a hold of that undefined point. So really all you can conclude is the function was not continuous. But I guess if we had to, let's see how it worked. Since f of x is continuous, on, let's do for this example up here, since f of x is continuous on 0, 2, then there is an absolute max and an absolute min on 0, 2 by the EVT. The absolute max is, in our scenario, 0. The absolute min is negative 1. One thing to be careful about is whether they ask you um, what it is or where it is. So the what is it is the y value. The absolute max right here is 9. The where is the x value. So at x equals 2, the absolute max of 9. All right. The big one that we do a lot is the mean value theorem. So I'm actually going to do that before roles because roles is just like a subset of it. So the MVT is the big one. It gets hit a lot. Um, in all of its cases, it gets hit analytically, graphically, and tabularly. So I'll throw a table for that one on as well when we get done. So this requires two things in the hypothesis. We must be continuous, continuous on the closed interval. We must be differentiable. I'm thirsty. I'm going to get a drink of water, if you don't mind my fine little children. I've been talking. I'm making all these videos. There we go. Differentiable on the open interval. 
these prepositional phrases are not required, so you don't have to write that stuff, but it's kind of impressive when kids do know that um, it has to be continuous on the closed. Oh, that water is top five. And differentiable on the open. One thing to note, differentiability implies continuity. So if they just tell you a function's differentiable, you get to infer that it's also continuous. The reverse is not true, and I don't know if I told you guys this, but I always think of Diet Coke. Differentiable means it must be continuous. It does not work the other way. For example, this is a continuous function for the entire realm of domain of real numbers, this absolute value function, but it is not differentiable right here at the vertex. So if it's differentiable, it had to have been continuous, but the converse of that statement is not true. All righty. So what do we get to conclude with this NVT sucker? Um, so if the function's continuous and differentiable, this is again an existence theorem. It guarantees that there exists I better not use symbols. Um, sorry, I, there's a whole bunch of symbols for words when you get into a class called proofs in college. And I've showed you a couple of them, like therefore, implies, element of, but there's more. There exists at least one C element of the clo open interval from A to B. So there's at least one X value such that now there's three ways to write this. The average rate of change equals the instantaneous. Slope of the secant equals slope of the tangent. I like to think this one. This will get you no points because you have to know what to fall back on, but slope of the secant line is just change in y over change in x, and the slope of a tangent line is a derivative. So, um, Really, the kicker is this guy. Graphically, it means that my secant line must run parallel to my tangent line at at least one value, and it exists this C value right here. Whoever wrote these notes, IRC, I'm assuming they mean instantaneous rate of change, and ARC, I'm assuming they mean average rate of change. When you do it analytically, you just basically do this algebra right here. When you do it tabularly, that's even more important. So let's work on the justification here, and then I'll go show you with a table. Since f of x is continuous on whatever, and actually, this is not true. See, that's what happens when you get stuff off the internet, differentiable. Since f of x is differentiable on the open interval, f of x is also continuous on the closed interval. And again, you don't have to put those prepositional phrases on it, but you have to say since f of x is differentiable and therefore continuous, it actually doesn't work the other way around. Um, then there is a value of x on the given interval where the average rate of change is equal to the instantaneous rate of change by the mean value theorem. Now we word these a little bit different, um, but again, this is really important. When we're justifying a theorem, we must always begin by stating or showing that the hypotheses have been met. I'm not gonna do roles because roles just basically says it's got one little more glitch to it. it. It says that f of a has to be equal to f of b, continuous differentiable. So it'll go one, two, three. If so, if I connect these two, I could do it a couple times like this, but it guarantees, because the slope of the secant line is zero, it guarantees a place where the derivative is specifically zero, but it's just a subcase of MVT. So I've pulled some of these off of past AP exams and we'll go through them. This was 2017, not too long ago actually, we're not going to do A, B, and C, but we called this one, I wasn't a reader for this, but um, it, they all get names, and this one was called functions, functions everywhere, because they gave you a table for G, a graph for H, 
an analytical model for F, and then they introduced K and M. So that's why they called this functions, functions everywhere. But it was a really easy question. I really like it, actually. The first part, A, said find the slope of the line tangent. That's the, just the derivative. That's F prime at pi. Well, all I needed to do was take the derivative of this. You don't know how to do E yet, but it's one of the easiest ones. And I had to plug a pi in. It was easy. Then K was defined as a composition of H and F. And you're supposed to, again, do the derivative. Well, that's the chain rule. It's H prime of F of X times F prime of X. And you were just to replace X with pi. So it's nice and easy. You might say, how do I get f of pi? It was just plug, plug. What's f prime of pi? Yeah, plug, yeah, plug. How do you get h prime? It's the slope over here. So it's actually very straightforward. It's just a lot of functions. m was defined as a product of two functions, and you were asked to find its derivative. That would have just been the product rule. So it's actually a very straightforward question. Um, We'll do it in full later in the year. This is the one I want to get there. Is there a number C? Hello, existence theorems, right? This is either IVT or MVT, because Rolls is really MVT, and EVT doesn't get asked on FRQs. So let's see about what it's talking about. Is there a C in the closed interval such that a derivative equals negative 4? This is MVT. It's talking about derivatives, not y values, derivatives. Justify your answer. So G is on the table. So I go up, and wouldn't it be nice if in G prime there was a negative 4 listed? I could say, hello, it's on the table. That wouldn't be calculus, right? So I am supposed to be looking on this interval from negative 5 to negative 3. I know I'm going to be using the MVT because it's asking about derivatives. The NVT says that the slope of the secant line has to be the same as the slope of the tangent line someplace. Well, I would check the full interval first. I would go 2 minus 10, I'm just doing it here, scratch work, negative 8, over negative 3 minus negative 5 is 2, and I got a negative 4. I got a slope of a secant line being negative 4. Well, since the function is differentiable and therefore continuous, the mean value theorem states the derivative has to be negative 4. Now I have to write that. Is there a number C in the closed interval? Justify your answer. Yes. That gets you zero points, right? First of all, I'm going to say since G is differentiable, and therefore continuous, you should state both. There was a year where if kids didn't state and therefore continuous, they didn't get full credit. I don't think it was this year. I don't remember, to be honest. Might have been last year, actually. And therefore continuous with, okay, what's happening that's allowing me to say this? I've got a slope of a secant line. Which one is it? I'm doing g of negative 3 minus g of negative 5 over negative 3 minus negative 5. Or you could do it the other way around. It doesn't really matter. I actually think I did it the other way around. Nope, I did it that way. So that would be 2 minus 10, which is negative 8. Again, I'm just going up here and doing slopes of secant lines from algebra 1. Change in y, negative 8 over change in x. Um, so that's kind of nice, which is 2. All right, let's go down here, equals negative 4. All right, so since g is differentiable and therefore continuous with basically the slope of the secant line equaling or the average rate of change equaling, but you don't even have to declare what this is. It's pretty obvious to a reader that you're doing an average. <clears throat> Sorry, need more water. I am parched. Now I have to reference the theorem I'm using, the NVT guarantees at least one, what did they call it, C, so we'll use C, in the open interval 
or closed interval, they don't care, such that the derivative there has to equal negative 4. That would get all two or three points. I don't remember how many that was worth. Probably, I don't know, <laughs> two or three. All right, 2018, this is last year's. All right, so this was their number four last year. It was about the height of a tree. I only clipped off two of the parts because I want to do the, it in full at some other time. But primarily, I'm doing it for part B. Explain why there must be, that's an existence theorem. It's either the IVT, guaranteeing a Y value, or the MVT, guaranteeing a derivative. Let's go take a look. H to H prime. This is the MVT again. So what do I need to find for the MVT? To get the derivative equal to 2, I need to get a secant line slope of 2. Somewhere in this interval. I always go to the ends first and give it a whirl. 15 minus 1 and a half over 10 minus 2 is not going to give me 2. And then I just start farting around in the interval a little bit. I probably wouldn't use this 1.5 because I can see this is a nice whole number. So I'd maybe try here. This would be 5 over 2. That's not going to do it. But if it said guarantees h prime of t equal to 5 over 2, I found my winning interval. 4 over 2. All right, there we go. I just found a slope of a secant line that's 4 over 2. Again, change in y over change in x. So I'm going to answer the question. Explain why there must be. Since <laughs> h is differentiable, I'm just going to write diffle, and therefore continuous, you should write the whole words out, right? With, what did I get to happen? I found the slope of a secant line, an average rate of change equaling 2. So let's say h of, I did h of 5 minus h of 3 over 5 minus 3. Change in y, 6 minus 2, over change in x, 5 minus 3, equals 2. So what have I done? I've stated my hypothesis that I've got a differentiable and continuous function with an average rate of change equaling 2. Now let's say the MVT, you must reference the theorem, you must state its hypothesis. Uh, the MVT guarantees at least one, and what are my x's? T at times, I guess. T in, now you can put the whole interval or just the small interval, but it says 2 to 10, so we'll go 2 to 10. I'm on a subset of 2 to 10, but um, guarantees at least one t element of 2 10 such that the derivative, such that the derivative there must equal 2. And again, MVT says average rate of change, slope of secant, has to equal instantaneous or the derivative at least once, as long as the function is continuous and differentiable. I'm not going to do that one. And maybe that one. Yeah. So this says, um, this is actually off of delta math. I didn't assign it, lucky you, but I don't think I might assign it later. Selected values of f are shown on the table below. f is differentiable, so they're meeting the hypotheses. Um, determine the validity of the following statement. There has to be at least one c on the entire interval such that the derivative equals 18 fifths. Well, let's do our change in y, 18, over change in x, 5. 18 fifths is the slope of the secant line between 1 and 6. Well, since the function's differentiable, the MVT guarantees at least one place where the derivative has to equal 18 fifths. So I would say this statement must be true. Done at 30 minutes. So I'm going to put this and put done. You get credit just for the notes only. Have a good one.